Hello, everybody. Welcome to Brockton Writers Series for September 8th, uh, 2021. Uh, we'd like to begin, as always, with a land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge that the Brockton organizers uh, used to and usually do our work on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat nations, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Uh, in today's world, we can do our work from everywhere, um, but everywhere in North America is Indigenous land. And so we strongly encourage uh, you to look up, if you don't already know, um, the First Nations um, in UE or uh, Métis land that you currently live on, work on, and the treaties and the legacy of the indigenous people of that area. Um, we acknowledge the ways that colonization, genocide and racism impact indigenous peoples um, and that settlers such as myself have a responsibility in making space at these events for indigenous voices. Uh, we all share the responsibility to critically understand and challenge forces of oppression. And for many of us, this includes recognition of how our ancestors as settlers uh, and ourselves as settlers and the structures that we work in have contributed to these colonial legacies with both silences and actions. Um, it means writing to your elected officials. Uh, it means holding uh, your governments and your workplaces uh, accountable. And uh, it means doing everything you can to understand the issues and to support and uplift Indigenous voices and rights. We'd also like to acknowledge that Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to feature and center Black and Indigenous voices, other people of color, and other underrepresented groups in our series. And this is included in our mandate. Thank you very much to Ephemera Series for hosting us on their online platform. Today's lineup includes a guest speaker followed by a brief Q&A, and then our four readers followed by a group Q&A for them as well. Each presentation will be a little shorter than we were in person and we will skip the break. Um, so the whole thing is a bit more condensed if you are somebody who used to attend uh, at Glad Day. Um, please type your questions into the YouTube chat box as they occur to you. There's a little bit of a lag, so it really helps us if you chat the, if you write them down sooner rather than later. Uh, we will collect them to ask during the q and A's. I'll turn it over to you, Emily. Rockton Writer Series was founded in November of two since we've been from literary are Clark love to hear from you. We would like to acknowledge with deep thanks the continued support of the Ontario and Albert of BFM but their events right here on this very YouTube channel. Uh, hi, everybody. We seem to be having a bit of a problem um, with uh, Emily's connection there. So uh, I'll just uh, uh, take over from there. Um, so uh, we've been active in Toronto literary scene for over a decade. Um, in today's world, we're very happy to be able to have people who aren't necessarily from Toronto be joining us tonight. Uh, our volunteers are Hannah, Am DeMichael, Nancy K. Clark, myself, Sonia Pather, Emily uh, Pathar, Emily Sanford, and we have the pleasure of working together to keep the Brockton Writer Series going. Uh, if you would like to join the team, please check in with us after the readings. Uh, we would love somebody to wrangle Facebook, uh, as well as other things. Oh, there's all kinds of things that need to be done. So check in with us. Uh, we'd love you to get involved. We'd like to acknowledge with deep thanks the continued support of the Ontario Arts Council who make this series possible. Um, and of course, we're also indebted to our gracious host, uh, Jen Albert of Ephemera Series. Uh, check out their events right here on this YouTube channel. Their next event is Wednesday, September 15th. That's next week. I'll be there. I hope you will too. 
Um, finally, with sincere thanks to you, our audience, for being here tonight, we will move on to our guest speaker. Tamara Faith Berger writes fiction, nonfiction, and screenplays. She's the author of Lie With Me, 2001, and The Way of the Whore, 2004, which were republished together by Coach House Books as Little Cat in 2013. Maidenhead 2012, which also won the Believer Book Award and Puntalini in 2016. Her fifth book, Queen Solomon, was published by Coach House Books in October 2018 and was nominated for a Trillium Book Award. Her work has been published in Apology Magazine, Canadian Art, Tattle Creek, and Canadian Notes and Queries. She has a BFA in Studio Art from Concordia University and an MFA in Creative Writing from the University of British Columbia. She lives and works in Toronto, where she co-runs the literary speaking series, Smutburger. I love that name, Smutburger. Tamara? Thanks. So it's, it's good now to go. I'm good to go. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I'm a little nervous. This is just like feels very nerve wracking to me. Um, but thank you so much for asking me uh, to do this, Brockton Writers. I'm happy to be here. Um, and I hope that we can have, yeah, a little Q&A or discussion after my talk. Um, so writing sex uh, as a part of your work or as the main subject matter, um, there's two things that I would like to discuss craft-wise. Um, well, also just letting you know that um, I came to sex writing from a pornographic angle. Um, you know, I had a job for maybe three, four years in my early 20s. Um, and I, I feel like that there's uh, some tricks of the trade, you know, of porn writing that does translate very well actually into literary fiction, poetry, nonfiction, just whenever you want to use or go into sex as a part of your work. So uh, the two points that I'll be discussing tonight are about employing the first person point of view, the I. Um, and I'm also going to talk just a little bit about threading in thinking to our sex scenes, um, which is not really porn's forte, um, but which can I find can be liberating, you know, for people that want to include sex in their work, whether it, no matter the genre, really. Um, so I just want to say that I like to shift away from um, psychology when we're thinking about writing sex as a part of our work. Um, it's the question's not really why any of us want to write about sex. And I also don't find why is a very interesting question in the actual scene. Um, it's more so, and there's quite a lot of meaning in how, right? How we choose to do it. Um, and also what I'm going to talk about is kind of also the how to create something sort of bubbling underneath or threaded through the sex scenes. So the how, how can we write in an effective way about sex? And of course, the answer is going to be different for every person. Um, but employing, I have found that employing the I to narrate a sex scene immediately gets both you, the writer, um, the narrator, and the reader very close, uh, sometimes uncomfortably close. And I like to call this the sexually active point of view. So very generally, the sexually active point of view is about telling us something that happened, perhaps even as it is happening. Um, it's the, I did this, or I'm doing this, I saw this, I smelled this, I sucked that, I felt it, I was there, that was me. Um, and it's essentially, in my mind, the private being made public, and I find that this is very powerful uh, around sex. And as it relates, I actually think that sex scenes, no matter the genre, kind of volley a little bit between high art and low art sort of vibe. Um, and you can call it erotica versus porn, or you can think of it as meshing, the meshing of a more literary or narrative urge with um, a body-based kind of anal, oral, genital sort of urge. Um, and mixing the high and the low using the sexually active point of view, the I, for me, just kind of fits together. It accesses the age-old technique of the confessional, uh, which is really a well-worn, well-trod way um, in literature to access sympathy, arousal feeling and you know in a more contemporary way of thinking of this I um, I think that the I the sexually active point of view gets us into a kind of radical subjectivity and of course with sexual subject matter this can be political and you know that old chestnut the personal is political in this I radical subjectivity about erotic experience 
uh, especially erotic experience that we may not have heard about so often before. So the second craft piece that I wanna talk about is thinking. Uh, how we can thread thinking into our sex scenes, which might, you know, just depending, feel very much either locked in the body or in the mind. So I think it's important, um, even if you're writing romance or erotica, which are genres often of emotional resolution um, or happy ending, to admit or include that negative, boring, traumatic, uncomfortable, or fearful sexual experiences and or thoughts are a fact of life. And this is just one way that I have found uh, to think about writing sex, to think about this notion of how or where your character or narrator finds themselves on the continuum of, or the reality fantasy continuum, which a simpler way of saying it is just good sex, bad sex. Um, and just to talk a little bit about my own works so of kind of like the easiest way for me to uh, explain what I'm saying about this kind of fantasy uh, reality continuum. Um, I've been really interested in my character's experiences between sort of horror and arousal, uh, between the worst thing happening and the best thing happening, um, between even being in pain and being in pleasure, between, I need a glass of civil water, between um, what they want and desire to happen to them and what is actually happening. Um, and I have found that playing or writing on this continuum between fantasy and reality has overall really uh, deepened my experience uh, <clears throat> of writing sex. Did I got the water? Um, basically that there is always something else happening for the narrator, right? More than just what is going on in front of them. And I know that not everyone is going to want to go this route, this walking of the reality fantasy line or the pleasure pain line or even the good sex, bad sex line. But this is sort of my how, right? How I approach sex writing. I approach it as an unstable scene, um, unfixed, things move, feelings change, and you might get caught. Ultimately, I think that writing and reading sex is about a willingness to enter the murkiness a bit of our desires, exploring a little bit the shadows of our desires and just to get a feel for it, like a chaos sometimes and that goes on inside of us and to stay there, to take a look around and to enter this disjunction and contradiction. And I really think that literature is a great place to experience this. I think it's better than pornography. <laughs> so I'm happy I made that switch. Um, and to conclude, and it's, it's very important for me to note um, that I do see my work coming out of a feminist writing practice. Um, like it, it literally came from porn, but it is also, you know, a uh, feminist practice. Um, it's both at the same time, uh, with a particular affinity for the tradition of literary experimentation um, by women that emerged, uh, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, kind of all over the world. And I guess I'm thinking of writers um, like Gail Scott in Canada, Kathy Acker, Dodie Bellamy, um, Dubravka Ugrasik, Alfred Yelenak, and there's many. And it's also um, about an experimental sort of tradition. I feel like it's a writing sex for me is kind of like a messing with the pipe kind of practice. One that wants to fuck up thought and language from the inside. And it's also pretty often for me about having um, a female eye or my eye in sacred or closed spaces. Uh, it's an urge, in, again, this is just for me uh, to participate in traditionally male only spaces uh, like pornography and like religion. Um, and sometimes the only way to enter forbidden spaces is to be stealthy, fiddle around with the pipes and leave a mess. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tamara. I uh, really, um, that it was every bit as juicy to hear all, to hear you talking about that. Um, I'm getting a pop-up that my internet connection is unstable. So if I disappear again, Dorianne, please 
jump in again. So I will do my best. Okay. Um, so we, we do have a question from our YouTube viewers. Um, are the recent books you can, are there recent books you can recommend that integrate sex really well? I'm assuming sex writing, all this, all the scenes that you've been talking about. Um, what would you suggest for um, recent books? Just very recently is Cleanness by Garth Greenwell. I think that's a really amazing book. He's a great writer. Um, and I really, really liked uh, Luster by Raven Leilani. Um, those, both of those books have a ton of sex in them um, that are done really well. Um, and actually right now I'm reading Mona um, by Pola. Um, it's right here, actually. Oh, I don't know how you pronounce properly her last name, but Olek, Olek Tarak, I'm not sure. But um, anyway, it's, it's, it's very funny too. I, I didn't mention humor in my talk, but humor is also something that can really go with sex like maybe well. Humor. That's great. That's, that's to me that I, I love seeing humor. It sort of brings in the unexpected. And sometimes when you launch upon a sex scene in your book, you're kind of like, oh gosh, holding yourself, trying to see, oh, is it going to be bad? Good? How is it going to go? And I love, I love it when it's really funny. Um, can you, can you think of any hilarious um, anecdotes, um, any, any funny sex scenes um, that come to mind? Well, I mean, the main one, of course, but it's, yeah, I read it like 25, 35 years ago is um, the, what's his name, Philip Ross. I mean, it's so bad now, like it might be terrible to read it, but what's that, his famous book? I feel like someone's- Sorry, say the author again. Portnoy's Complaint, Portnoy's Complaint by uh, Philip Ross. Oh, That's okay. Really <laughs> stupid, terrible, bad. It, of course, reading it from now, but sex, but yeah, but it's very funny. That's great, though. <laughs> but, I mean, that's not, that's not a great example, you know. I'm sure there's been many more since, you know, the 60s. Oh, but sometimes it's, it's nice to go back to the thing that really um, was your first experience with, like, hilarity and, and that kind of reading, that kind of scene. So um, we have another question for you. Within the story, do you find it hard when you have to write the sex scene again between the same characters, but in a different way that can continue to intrigue readers? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think it's, it's I think it depends. I, I like to think of sex in a book as part of the narrative and furthering the narrative, right? So I think if you can think of another, if they're having sex, if the characters are having sex again, there's another. So there's something else, like I was talking about, sort of going on for them, and it's either furthering the, you know, their story or taking them backwards or, you know, yeah. So I guess that's what I can to that as opposed to maybe just like changing the, the, the what they're actually doing in bed although that or wherever they're doing it you know it doesn't need to be in bed but just that kind of um you know those two things might go together the narrative tension or the narrative drive and what they're doing but um yeah I think it's just about to think about the story and, and what's going on underneath for them mm -hmm. like dialogue can catapult a story sometimes or or catapult it backward too. Um, I imagine different interactions, sex scenes, different different encounters could do the same thing um, and very likely does um, <laughs> in lives as well as in literature. <laughs> I have a question if we have a minute. We do. Um, Lie With Me was made into a movie and the movie was very sexually explicit. I wasn't sure going into it. I was like, what are they, how are they going to make a movie out of this? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I wondered like, you know, how, what was that like? Did you, did they come to, to movie producers come to you and say, yes, we want to do this. Or did you have to negotiate with them to have the sex as explicit as it was in the movie version? Um, well, like the, the person who made the movie, I like, he's my partner, right? Oh, well, that explains that. <laughs> so I think like for him that it was that was part of the interest in him making it you know like in in a certain way um but weirdly enough like at the time I mean also I had never really been involved in anything movie wise before at that time it was a long time ago it was 2004 um maybe 2003 2004 like it was a long time ago and um 
I think like I, in a weird way, I kind of just gave it to him and like, let him do his interpretation of it because yeah, it's really different, you know? Um, And how can you really translate all that to, to, uh, (laughs) I mean, you know, some of those scenes in line with me, the book are like insane, right? They're (laughs) very porno, right? So yeah. Yeah, and he wasn't trying to make a porno. I didn't realize that was your partner. So thanks for that explanation. Um, but I think it's really great that you can you can do that letting go. Um, it, you know, I've I've done that a bit before with like theater plays where I'm just like, I've written this play. It's it's in your hands now to do in a fringe festival in another city where I'll never even see it. Um, it's 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 a it's a it's interesting to let go of your work in that way. Yeah, I think it's it's good it's exercise. Obviously, you don't want the piece to be ruined or anything like that, but they, it still exists. Like nothing gets destroyed in the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, do we have any further questions for Tamara before we move along? Uh, any from the YouTube chat? I'm just going to zip over and have a quick check, um, but I don't see any other... Any new ones in the YouTube chat? Okay. Well, Tamara, thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks so much for sharing with us all of your expertise um, in writing, uh, writing sex, writing juicy scenes. Yeah. Thanks. thanks for having me. So usually at this point, we would hand around a picture for pay what you can donations to help support us and our writers, but we can't do that in a pandemic. So we do have a PayPal account. Uh, we would love it if you could go to paypal.me slash Brockton Writers, and we'll put that in the chat. Um, if you could spare a few dollars for our brilliant writers. Um, and if you'd like to take our survey and suggest topics for future guest speakers, uh, please take our very brief B- uh, BWS survey and let us know your thoughts. We will also post that link in the chat. Um, we would love for you to suggest topics, specific speakers, other readers that you'd like to see. Uh, we want to hear from our audience. And now for the readers. Again, please type your questions into the chat as they occur to you as there's a bit of a delay and we're going to gather the questions and ask them to all four readers at the end. First up, we have Antonio Michael Downing, who grew up in southern Trinidad, northern Ontario, Brooklyn and Kitchener. He's a musician, writer, and activist based in Toronto. His 2010 debut novel, Molasses, from Blaurock Plet. No, I should have got a pronunciation check on that. Blaurock? You'll have to correct me on that, Antonio Michael. Was published to critical acclaim. In 2017, he was named by RBC Taylor Prize as one of Canada's top emerging authors for nonfiction. He performs and composes music as John Orpheus. Hey, hi everyone. Um, uh, It's an honor to be here and to be the first reader. Um, uh, And thanks to Tamara for that really interesting talk. And uh, I didn't, I do know who Clement is, so I didn't know, (laughs) I did know that he directed your book. Um, I'm going to read two pieces uh, from my, my book Saga Boy, which came out on Penguin Random House and is coming out uh, on milkweed editions in America in a week. <laughs> um, so uh, very excited for that. And, um, but yeah, talking about growing up in a lot of places, um, uh, I'm gonna read uh, two selections, one from being a kid in Trinidad and one from the first time I came to Canada, my first winter in Canada. Um, I came to Canada in the middle of December, 1986 which in Northern Ontario, um, and I don't mean Sudbury, I mean like Dryden um, is a terrifying place. (laughs) So um, I'll say that. And and yeah, but first of all, I wanted to um, say thank you to um, Brockton Writers for having me and to all the amazing um, authors here, um, uh, Jonina, Fonda, Tamara, and uh, and C.L. Polk. Uh, big up yourself, as we say in the vernacular. Um, And yeah, here we go. So uh, this is from chapter one, Monkey Town. Pulori was my everything. Pulori. These three delicious syllables ruled my life. I was five. And if I ever got my hands on as little as 15 cents, I would buy pulori a fluffy golden deep fried ball of dough 
that was crunchy on the outside and chewy on the inside. I lived in New Grant, a village in the south of Trinidad, or down south, as we would say. It sat between wide, muddy rivers full of crocodiles, thick tropical wilderness, and fields upon fields of sugarcane. The yellow and brown two-story building where we learned was called New Grant Anglican School, and it had been established in the year 1900. To the front, there was a paved asphalt area where we played netball, rounders, and hopscotch in our neat uniforms in the field next to that. We dashed about, made believe, and whenever possible, yelled as loudly as we could. Next to this field was a small shop of wonders. They sold pickled red mango, co coconut sugar cakes, sticky peppery anchar, and of course, pulori. It was pretty much neutral in taste, but it was served with spicy mango, chutney, or sticky sweet tamarind so sauce on brown wax paper. Pulori was my favorite thing. One day, I bought three or four of four and was fixated on inhaling them while waiting to cross the main road. I was straining not to get any chutney on my cocky uniform. Cars roared by while I stood, my mouth wet and wet with wanting. I was captivated by the mesh pattern inside the dough balls, by the heat of the wax paper and the green mango chutney. Just as I looked up, a 20 seat maxi taxi passenger van dashed right by my nose. My nostrils burned with diesel. A drunk on the other side of the road staggered backwards, his eyes bulging big like guavas. You're gonna get killed one day. In Trini, an alcoholic was a rumble. Everybody drank rum. And I knew from the way big people talk that you never listen to a rumble. Still, I finished my pulori, which was never pulories, even if you had several, and looked both ways before crossing to my street, Monkey Town Road, Third Branch, which at this point was the only place in the universe I knew. On a day like that, it would have been normal to hear the sound of Miss Exley's voice drifting over the tombstones. There was a cemetery on either side of the street and ours was the first house after the one on the left. Her voice would catch me as soon as I left the junction, drifting like a breeze. My grandma, we called her mama, and everyone else called her Miss Exley, was always singing. When she woke up with the Kiskadees, when she was happy and smiling, when she was thoughtful and laughing to herself, or when she went to bed, the bullfrogs as her backup, she sang, hymns mostly, about Jesus and salvation and redemption and power. So basically every single song in the Anglican hymnal, power in the blood, how great thou art, rock of ages, abide with me. And the draggy one that was her favorite, stars in my crown, which I didn't really understand then, except I knew it had something to do with getting stars in your crown when at evening the sun goeth down in the mansions of rest. What I did know was that her bright eyes and soft face got very strange when she sang this hymn. She would smile and her whole face, she would smile with her whole face, but have tears in her eyes. Was it possible to be happy and sad at once? In those moments coming home from school, the world seemed dim and out of focus. Everything hushed. Her voice perfumed the very air. The tall grass across the cemetery leaned in slow motion. Beads of sweat slid down my forehead and tickled my neck. All of creation became her voice calling me home. And now, um, fast forward um, to, uh, 1986. One night, I fell asleep in the tropical jungle, and a few days later, I woke up in a blizzard. I was in a tiny place called Wabagoon, 
in the vast forests of Northern Ontario, Canada. It was the dead of winter. My world, which, is always, which had always been set in a teeming rainforest, had become a dead emptiness buried in snow and ice. In a way, it was just a new kind of bush. But while Trinidad was always lush and bursting with noise and fruit and vibrant colors, this new bush was barren as the surface of the moon, a silent blanket of whiteness. Icicles hung, glistening from the eave troughs. Snowbanks were piled as high as treetops. The angry wind howled in the bluffs. I peeked out the window of our little house behind the tavern with my eyes wide and bewildered. Nothing would ever be the same. My dead grandmother haunted me. I kept replaying the details of her death as if turning them over and over would make them less confusing. I remembered her first stroke and the way it made the right side of her face droop like melting plastic. I recall strangers milling about waiting for her to either recover or pass away. At her sister Teresa's, she was in the small room upstairs with a kerosene lamp and a bed too big for the walls. Her bracelets turned black. This happens, people said, when silver is pure and mixes with the chemicals given off by the skin of the sick. When lucid, she would try her heavy tongue at groaning out words no one could understand. When it got bad, she coughed up buckets of thick yellow phlegm and groaned in deep booming notes of misery that struck me with dread and were still echoing in the corners of my head. Her room filled with the smell of death. I clung to her skirts even still and lay down in the bed beside her until someone forced me to get up. The grown folks looked at me, their brows knotted with pity. In their whispers, I heard, she's waiting for Joan. She's holding on till Joan comes from Canada. I watched Mama die, her eyes fixed on something no one could see, and her mouth hung open as her last breath escaped. I was still clinging to her skirt. Throughout all this, I did not cry. It did not move me emotionally perhaps because I was paralyzed with fear, or perhaps because I didn't understand what any of it meant. I simply watched, stunned, as everything I had ever known came to an end. On that happy note, that is all. Thank you so much, Antonio Michael. It's beautiful. Um, I loved, she would smile with her whole face. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, next, we have Fonda Lee. Fonda Lee is the World Fantasy Award winning author of The Green Bone Saga, beginning with Jade City and continuing in Jade War and the forthcoming Jade Legacy, as well as the acclaimed science fiction novels Zero Boxer, Exo, and Crossfire. Fonda is a three time Aurora Award winner and a multiple finalist for the Nebula and Locus Awards. Fonda, welcome. Thanks. So I struggled a little bit trying to decide what to read tonight because I have, I'm on the verge of launching the third book in an epic fantasy trilogy. Um, so I've been spending the last two years closing out this huge series and everything in that book, um, which comes out on November 30th, it's this, this brick, um, is spoiler. So it's just like 700 straight pages of spoiler. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to um, read from, from Jade City, which is the first novel in the Greenbone Saga. Um, so if you are, which I hope if you have read, if you read the book, you'll still enjoy it. And if you have not, you won't, um, nothing will be spoiled for you. Um, the Greenbone Saga is a, it's a secondary world epic fantasy that um, I have described as a, a, a uh, martial arts um, gangster family saga uh, that takes place in a modern era Asia inspired metropolis. So the things that you want to know about this um, before I read this piece is that um, there is a country, a fictional country called Kekon, and it is the only place in the world with uh, 
a resource known as bioenergetic jade. And the people who live there are able to wear this jade and it gives them greater than human powers. Um, and the rest of the world um, cannot use, other people cannot use this, but um, uh, it is modern times and the world is opening up and there are, there are certainly um, people from other um, countries and cultures who, who want that jade as well. Um, the, this is going to be a chapter from the point of view of a character who is coming home to KCON after having um, been away for quite a while. Um, and uh, let me see, do you need to know anything else? The, the island is essentially ruled by two large family clans. So there, there's a government, but like the, the people who can use jade are called green bones. And um, the clans are really sort of the, the shadow, the power behind the power, if you will. And um, the story takes place primarily from the point of view of one of these, of these clans and um, their family. Call Shailen San arrived in John Loon International Airport with the vaguely hungover, cotton-headed feeling symptomatic of all 13-hour flights. Crossing the ocean, staring out the window at the passing expanse of blue, She'd felt as if she were turning back time, leaving behind the person she'd become in a foreign land and returning to her childhood. She was confused by the combination of emotions this aroused in her, a poignant, bittersweet mixture of elation and defeat. She collected her baggage from the carousel. There wasn't much. Two years in Espania, an unaccountably expensive university degree, and all her worldly possessions fit into a single red leather suitcase. She was too tired to smile at this pathetic irony. She picked up the receiver of a payphone and began to deposit a coin into the slot, then stopped, remembering the bargain she'd made with herself. Yes, she was returning to John Loon, but she would do so on her own terms. She would live as an ordinary citizen of the city, not like the granddaughter of the torch of Kekon which meant not calling her brother to send a chauffeured car to pick her up from the airport. Shea replaced the phone receiver in its cradle, caught off guard by how easy it had been to slip into old behaviors within minutes of setting foot on KCON. She sat down on a bench in the baggage claim area for a few minutes, suddenly reluctant to take the final steps through the revolving exit doors. Something told her that when they spun her around and pushed her out, the journey would be irrevocable. Finally, though, she could delay no longer. She stood up and followed the stream of other passengers out to the taxi line. When she'd left two years ago, Shay had never intended to move back. She'd been full of anger and optimism, determined to forge a new life and identity for herself in the great, wide, modern world beyond KCON, away from anachronistic clans and the outsized male egos of her family. Once in Espenia, she found it harder than she'd expected to escape the stigma of being from a small, small island country known mostly for one thing, Jade. Indeed, Shay learned that the name John Loon often provoked blank looks. The foreigners called it something else, Jade City. When people abroad learned she was Kekanese, their reactions were comically predictable. Initially, surprise, Kekon was an exotic, make-believe place in the minds of most Espenians. The post-war boom in global trade was reversing its centuries of isolation, but not yet entirely. She might as well have said she was from outer space. The second response, eager jesting. So can you fly? Can you punch through this wall? Show us something amazing. Here, break this table. She'd learned to take it with grace. At first, she tried to explain. She'd left all her jade back on KCON. She was no different from them now. Whatever advantages in strength, speed, and reflexes, she possessed were accounted for by the fact that she still woke early and trained on her apartment patio every morning. Lifelong habits persisted after all. The first two weeks had been almost unbearable, the feeling of being in a deprivation chamber of her own making. Everything so much less than it used to be, less color, less sound, less feeling, a washed out dreamscape, her body slow, heavy, achy, a nagging suspicion of having lost something vital, like looking down and noticing you were missing a limb, the nighttime panic and the sensation of being adrift, of the world not being real. 
it would have been bad enough, even if she wasn't surrounded by boisterous young Espenians who had the attention span of monkeys. And we're always talking about clothes, cars, popular music, and the vagaries of their shallow, convoluted relationships. She almost relented. She even booked a flight back to KCON after the first term, but pride overcame even the near debilitating horror of Jade withdrawal. Fortunately, the flight had been refundable. It was far too complicated to explain to her few college friends what it meant to be jaded, to come from a Greenbone family, and why she'd given it up. So she just smiled innocently and waited until their curiosity waned. Gerald always teased her. You walk around acting all normal, but one day you're going to bust out doing some crazy shit, aren't you? No, she'd already done that. He was the crazy shit. The sky was that odd mixture of haze and waning light. The concrete was damp with northern sweat, the incessant drizzle and mist that pervaded the coastal plain around John Loon during monsoon season. It was late, past dinner time. Shay stood in line and waited for a taxi. The other people in line did not pay her any attention. She was dressed in a colorful, short summer dress that was fashionable in Espenia, but felt too clingy and garish in her home country. But accepting that, she blended in, looked like any other traveler, jadeless. It was with relief and a twinge of self-pity that she realized there was little chance anyone would recognize her. The next taxi arrived. The driver put her suitcase in the trunk as Shay climbed into the back seat and rolled down the window. Where to, miss? He asked. Shay considered going to a hotel. She wanted to shower, to decompress from the long flight, to be by herself for a little while. She decided against showing such disrespect. Home, she said. She gave the driver the address. He pulled away from the curb and into the streaming jostle of cars and buses. As the taxi crossed the Wayaway Bridge and the steel and concrete skyline of the city came into view, Shay was struck by a sense of nostalgia so profound she found it difficult to breathe. The humid air through the open window, the sound of her native language being spoken on the radio, even the terrible traffic. She swallowed, close to tears, she had only the vaguest idea of what she was going to do in John Lou now, but she was undeniably home. When they entered the Palace Hill neighborhood, the taxi driver started glancing back at her in the rear view mirror, eyes flicking up every few seconds. When the taxi arrived in front of the tall iron gates of the Call Estate, Shay rolled down the window and leaned out to speak to the waiting sentry. Welcome home, Shay Jen, said the guard surprising her with the now inaccurate suffix, as well as the sense of familiarity in attaching it to her given name. The guard was one of Hilo's fingers. Shay recognized his face but could not remember his name, so she merely nodded in greeting. The taxi drove through the gates to the roundabout in front of the main house. Shay reached for her purse to pay the driver, but he said, there's no fee, called Jen. I'm so sorry, I didn't recognize you at first in those foreign clothes. He turned around to smile at her with earnest hopefulness. My father-in-law is a loyal lantern man. Lately, he's having a little business trouble. If there was a way you... She pressed the money into the driver's hands. Take your fee, she insisted. I'm only Miss Call now. I don't have any say in the clan. Tell your father-in-law to send word up the proper channels to the weatherman. She suppressed her guilt at the man's disappointed expression, got out of the taxi and hefted her suitcase up the steps to the entrance. Kianla, the Abuke housekeeper, met her at the door. Oh, Shay, so you look so different. She hugged Shay and held her out at arm's length. And you smell Espenian. She laughed gaily. But I shouldn't be surprised now that you're a big shot Espenian businesswoman. Shay smiled weakly. Don't be silly, Kianla. Through sheer workaholic grit, she'd graduated to the top third of her class despite the fact that she'd been studying in her second language and having been schooled at Caldew Academy found the Espenian classroom environment utterly bewildering. So much sitting around in large rooms and talking, as if every student wanted to be the instructor. In the spring, she'd interviewed with some of the big companies that recruited on campus. She'd even received an offer for an entry position at one of them. But she'd seen how the interviewers looked at her. When she walked into the room, the men around the table, they were always men, assumed she was Tuni or Shotarian, and the first glimmer of prejudice would come into their eyes. When they looked at her resume and saw she was from KCON, that she'd been raised to be a green bone, their expressions would cloud with outright skepticism. The Espenians might be proud of their military might, but they had little regard for her martial education. What use would it be in a civilized, professional place like an Espenian corporation? This wasn't KCON, where the name Call was golden. 
the right word from her grandfather wouldn't get her anything. In those moments, her romantic notions of making it on her own felt foolish, foolish and lonely. Now, here she was, back in the house she hadn't been able to leave fast enough a couple of years ago. Lon was standing at the bottom of the staircase. He smiled. Welcome home. Shay went to him and embraced him tightly. He hadn't, she hadn't seen her older brother in two years and was overwhelmed by the rush of affection she felt for him. Lon was nine years older than she. They had never been playmates, but he had always been kind to her. He defended her from Hilo, had not judged her when she'd left, and had been the only member of the family to write to her when she was studying in Espana. Sometimes his letters in their precise, even handwriting had felt like the only link she had to cake on, the only evidence that she had a family and a past. Granda's not doing so well. He'd ended simply at the end of his last letter. The decline is more in his spirits than his health. I know he misses you. It would be good of you to come back to see him and Ma as well after you graduate. With the sting of splitting from Gerald still as fresh as an oozing burn, she'd reread her brother's letter, turned down the single job offer and booked a flight back to John Loon. Lon hugged her back and kissed the center of her forehead. Shay said, how's Granda? At the same time, he said, your hair. They both laughed and Shay suddenly felt as if she let out a breath she'd been holding for two years. Lon said, he's waiting for you. Do you want to go up? Shay took a deep breath and nodded. I don't suppose it'll get any easier if I wait. They climbed the stairs together, his hand on her shoulder. So close to him, she could feel the tugging hum of his jade, a barely perceptible texture in the air that her body responded to with a yearning squeeze of the stomach as she leaned in closer to him. It had been such a long time since she'd been affected by jade that she felt lightheaded. She forced herself to straighten away from Lon and face the double doors before her. He's gotten worse lately, Lon said. Today's a good day, though. Shay knocked. Call Sen's voice came back with surprising vigor through the door. I could perceive you, you know, even without your jade coming through the door and dwaddling your way up here. Come in, then. Thank you so much, Fonda. I can't wait for the final book to come out. Uh, Shay is a fantastic, fantastic character. Um, so many other fantastic characters in there as well. And sometimes it makes you cry. Um, next up, we have uh, Yonina Curtin, a Red River Métis Icelandic poet who was 61 when she received the 2016 Vancouver Mayor's Arts Award for an emerging artist in the literary arts category. Her second collection of poetry, An Honest Woman, was a finalist in the 2018 Dorothy Livesay Poetry Prize. Yanina? Thank you so much. Oh, well, this will be a change because I'm a poet. So <laughs> mind you, I do write uh, more narrative poetry. Uh, so it's not like some poetry can be. I am interested very much in story. So I'm coming to you from the uh, land of the Coast Salish nations, uh, Kitquat nations, Stolo, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Kwantlen, many of them used this area, which we think of as New West today. And they all used the river. So uh, there's probably some nations that we're still figuring out we need to name. Um, it's an ongoing process. So I want to thank Brockton for having me. And uh, Tamara, good for you. I'm gonna read your book. It's something I've thought about myself writing. <laughs> I wouldn't put my picture on the book, though, because people wouldn't buy it. They go, what would she know? 66, right? You know, so <laughs> gray haired. So I uh, also, An Antonio, my gosh, alchemy. There's alchemy in your words. I could feel it. Good medicine. Thank you. And Fonda, I love uh, that type of writing. And um, I have to confess that I don't do a lot of reading of it, but I certainly watch a lot of shows that would probably be made from that type of writing. I tend to read more poetry. So I have, uh, I'm a late blooming poet. I started writing at 50 and I, this is one of my very first poems that I wrote that I liked. Uh, so I wrote a lot of stuff I didn't like. And it is about my life as a young woman being mixed blood, uh, growing up in Winnipeg, uh, 
I uh, lost two brothers in their teens and there was a lot of violence in my home. So I had a lot of things to deal with. So I decided to toddle off to the disco and drink and dance and forget about all of that stuff for a number of years. So this is a little bit about that time in my life. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. It's called Collective History. Divergent lives meet at the border. Bogarts on the edge where the North End meets downtown. Winnipeg's Studio 54, an old bank building where life's deserters cross over, meet on the dance floor. Tuxedo boys, rich, looking to drown out the voices of obligation, crave the drugs that the arsonist and the boxer provided. Portage in Maine, an intersection where need meets want, and amid the inner rubble, the marble pillars, we all play a transactional game where everyone tries to trade up. In his tower, the DJ, a demigod of nightly worship, takes us into trance dance. Encoded in our bodies, a collective history of days when we hung mirrors on trees, when pain and pleasure reflected visceral truth. We are all crows, like shiny things. The mirror ball shining light offers flickering fractures, but never invites reflection. Heavy with memory, my body finds wordless ways to stir cellular recall. My turtle mind slow, steady, walks me to the dance floor where my snake body dances me. I am in a moving sea of sound within the beginning of time, an elemental dreaming born of water. Inside, the oracle divines my salvation, but I am still suspicious of my body's story, leave a trail of marooned memories, frozen fragments, Parts of me are scattered on the altar of one night stands. Once home, haunted by my losses, I weep. Water meets wood as I lay on the hardwood floor, contemplate the collective curse in our genes. A shame carrier, I am doomed to wander. I am a vortex of empty space where my bitterness and brooding calls out to the hag. Our dark truths pass between us like a smoldering joint. Shared suffering never articulated leaves a residue, causes an itch that cannot be scratched. I am a curious contradiction like the sun and its shadow, trying to forget my own fragility suspended between two worlds. I exist between night and day where salt becomes wisdom and at the end of my bed, a pack of black dogs. On my lips, a thickening scar, tastes of toxic soup, a fog and within it, a spell cast over the victims. We carried our shame to the dance floor, the crimes of our ancestors, a collective illness. Their original sin follows us to after hours clubs, this time rich boys and bikers, occasionally an allergic reaction. Earthbound alchemists, we all learned that the rise of smoke cannot be hastened, that sometimes passions are their own punishment. Ooh, so that was me going to the disco to drown out my sorrows and then coming home and laying on the floor and crying. My neighbor told me I was, my next door neighbor told me, did you know you come home and cry? Uh, no, I didn't know. <laughs> and I was kind of embarrassed, let me tell you, I was like 23 years old. So from that, I also had the confusion of my ancestry. So I did not, my family said that we were French. And I used to think, have you looked in the mirror lately? Because I, I, you're not fooling anybody. They were clearly Indigenous, especially my father. And so it caused a lot of confusion. And so I wasn't told the stories of my ancestors. So this piece speaks to a little bit of that. It's called Untethered. Is it my blood that makes me wander? The diaspora of my soul scattered over many lands. The bones of my ancestors, how they pull on me, offering so many directions. Yet how can I answer the many folded within my body? This body, not my own, a shared place of suffering, it searches for safety, looks for a cord tying me to you and you and you. And yet we will all soon leave this room, leave each other. 
It is then that I will feel how alone I am in the territory of the Salish with the bones of my ancestors scattered over many lands. Some just north of here, Port St. James, the place where many lay. Others can be found at Turtle Mountain, the prairies, Laons de Meadows, and Iceland. As I trace their steps, I feel them beside me, whispering, look here, comes another voice, no, here. Their stories forgotten, they ask me to sing home their bones to find them in the stories of our people. They ask me to tether myself to them and to the stories. To, pardon me, they ask me to tether myself to them and to the stories. A chain unbroken, we are stronger. The stories of those that came before the link. Untethered, we are lost. But if we are patient in our searching, we may find a way out of this place of loss out of the wandering that comes when one does not know the stories of their ancestors. And I read that knowing for some people, it's never an option to find where they've come from. And I, I can imagine that must be a, a deep burden to carry. I was fortunate because I was Métis and uh, the Métis are fairly well documented, it turns out, especially if your family worked for the HBC and the Northwest Company, which mine did. So I was able to uncover a lot of stories and I was pretty excited at first until I discovered how many of them were involved in colonizing. <laughs> I was expecting something different. So one of my ancestors was the one that brought Simon Fraser here. And I live near the Fraser River, which I find very interesting. He was a Métis voyageur, spoke about seven languages, and he was his uh, interpreter and guide. And so there's sort of this mixed feeling of pride and not pride around my ancestry. One thing that I do feel pride about is how strong my ancestors were and I carry their love of rivers. So this I wrote after reading a lot about our history and it's called Born of Water, which is a line that's in the, uh, one of the other poems as well. Born of water meant to float. I sink until I rise to the big sky songs of my people, traveling rivers, strong arms paddling one stroke per second. My ancestors' canoes carried them north. Where a daughter is born, the mixing of blood continued until I, born of water, give thanks, hold my hands up to the big sky. Rolling back west, I kneel before the mountains, sit by an ocean of words, my place uncertain until I, born of water, hear the songs of the Métis voyageurs paddling one stroke per second. They did that for 12 hours at a time, which is incredible. I'll just read one more poem. And this one is a little bit, I'm starting to try to write more about healing after writing many years about other things. So this is a little bit about some of the healing. It's called tumbling. There are rocks in my pocket, one for each death. The first rocks, my ancestors whispering thin, easily airborne, skipping over waters of the past. These brought comfort, became touchstones. But then came the drowning, my brother, 16. Now a river rock made smooth by loss sits next to the others. Four years later, a bullet, my brother, 18, his rock marked by mushroomy metal, leaving a hole in him, in me. Before long, another rock, this one larger as it was mother. Aunties, uncles, grandmothers, grandfathers followed. For so long, I carried the dead. Afraid to let them go, I brought them everywhere. Others could not see the rocks in my pockets. They could not hear the tumbling, did not feel the heat of the rubbing against one another. Every rock heavier than the last, harder to carry. Yet together we all walked, losses rubbing up against one another pressing on my thighs until open seams stretched empty my pockets. I have been carrying the dead my whole life. I had to let them go. That was the, finally when I was able to do that was after you know, 35 years of healing. It took to get to that place where I could let them go and not feel an obligation. I'm sure you've all heard of survivor's guilt. It's a, it's a real thing. And in the Indigenous communities, we have uh, enormous number of losses. 
um, all of us um, for different reasons. But anyway, thank you so much for hearing my words and I'm looking forward to hearing Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yonina. Um, that was beautiful. Um, I love the image of losses rubbing against one another. That is very moving. Yeah. Um, next we have C.L. Polk. C.L. Polk wrote the Kingston Cycle, including WFA winning Witchmark. The Midnight Bargain was a Canada Reads, Nebula, Locus, Ignite, and WFA finalist. Mix Polk lives in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Con Confederacy, the Tsutina, the Iaxe, Nakoda Nations, and the Metis Nation Region 3. Welcome, Chelsea. And you're still on mute, Chelsea, if you want to unmute your mic. All right, am I unmuted now? You are. Hooray. Okay. Um, let's see. I didn't actually like prepare any kind of an introduction or a preamble or anything like that. Um, I'm just going to read from the Midnight Bargain. Um, I think the selection that I picked was too short, however, so I'm just trying to find something a little bit longer, I usually plan for about five minutes and that's not enough. Um, so um, Yeah, I'm really sorry. Um, I didn't realize that I was going to get to read for quite that long. Okay, I'm going to start from chapter three. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just going to read it. Beatrice awoke with the echoing pressure of a headache and Clara laying out a dress choice for a day cooped up indoors waiting for collars. A printed cotton stripe trimmed in 30 point lace, the skirt a soft conical increase to be worn without a fulling cage. Clara halted with the gown in her arms and smiled. Good morning, Beatrice. Are you ready for your collar? It was time to wake up. It was time to smile and be unfailingly polite and find out why Isabella Levon now wanted her acquaintance when she clearly had not wanted it at the bookstore. Good morning, Clara. The stripe will do. Not the peach with the lady slipper embroidery? My caller is to be Isabella Levon, not Iante. She insisted on seeing me first. Hmm. There could be a dozen reasons for that. Clara laid the gown on the foot of the bed and moved to Beatrice's bedside, dabbing a cloth in a basin of water. She wiped Beatrice's face. You're frowning. Headache. You drank too much elderflower punch. Clara swiped down her neck. I'll have Cook mix you a potion. I'll bring it to you in your bath. Up you come, out of bed. Clara guided Beatrice to the bathing chamber and unbuttoned her nightgown, leaving Beatrice to descend into the water herself and place a cool cloth over her eyes. She had these few moments to herself before she was expected at breakfast, and then she would be pinned and laced into a gown that displayed her like a jewel and sent an artful message that she, expecting a quiet afternoon at home, had dressed herself simply. But the cut of the gown from neckline to hem was meant to flatter her youth. She was meant to be interrupted at a creative pursuit designed to reveal her education and skill. She was expected to display a sense of beauty and the skill to produce it. She played viola, though few women performed for public entertainment. She could draw in colored pastel and paint in oil, though few women's work hung on display in the galleries of Chasland. She was proficient in knitting, hooked lace, and simple embroidery, all skills that would be displayed on her children's clothing. 
Beatrice's head pounded, and she flipped the washcloth over, trying to sink into its soothing, cool embrace. Mercifully, the door opened, and Clara hustled inside. Beatrice lifted the cloth from her eyes and accepted the dose bottle, tipping it to her lips. Cook had tried to sweeten it, which only made it worse. Skyborn, gods, that's awful! Beatrice grasped. Thank you, Clara. Is there water? I'll get it! Harriet, having just come in, crossed to the jug and poured a cup. Oh, I'm going to die, just die! Harriet whispered. Yeah, the Levan is coming to call on you. He is beyond a Valserre and Marquis. He is beyond even a minister. Beatrice is just like crossing Quill Street, where young Laura Cooper catches the attention of the Margrave of Went, and... Oh, no. Harriet didn't know the truth. Harriet, it's not what you imagine. But he helps her father catch a hen, Harriet insisted. Oh, what? We do not keep hens. Neither did they, Harriet counted. It was from the market. Beatrice didn't want to begin untangling her little sister's logic. As you say... Harriet, mother called. Come here, please. Harriet huffed, but she left Beatrice alone. Once clean, Beatrice donned a dressing gown and went downstairs to breakfast. A copy of the morning's broadsheet sat next to father's empty place, and Beatrice picked one up, turning the pages to the shipping and finances section. Harriet leaned over to swat at her hands. You'll get ink smudged on your fingers. Ink comes off. Beatrice leaned away from her sister and read, Show Automations is putting on display of the latest inventions from Visni. These automatic wonders will delight on workers as they usher in a new age of productivity and convenience. Here in Pendleton, mother asked, in Meryton, I should like to see them. I understand that they can spin fine thread at astonishing speeds. It would be worth investing in manufactories for cotton if one acted quickly. "'Beatrice,' father said. He walked into the breakfast room and plucked the paper from her hands. "'What did I say about ladies reading the paper at breakfast?' "'That it leads to squinting and wrinkles. "'But, father, have you considered what I said about timber and iron yesterday?' Father gave Beatrice a look of patient disappointment. "'You shouldn't be troubling yourself with such thoughts. "'You should be bursting with news of the assembly dance last night, "'of all the gentlemen you met.' How many did you meet? Father moved to the head of the table, and servers moved into action, bringing heated plates of breakfast dishes to the family. We left before midnight, Father, Harriet said. Beatrice hardly had a chance to meet anyone. Father folded the paper so he could peer over it. I thought the assembly dance was important. It is! Harriet exclaimed, but Beatrice got her own cake, and she didn't dance once. Beatrice, father said, I do wish you would take your duties seriously. Look at Harriet. She needed to be at that ball to make friends her own age. Leaving early cost her opportunities. I'm sorry, father. She wasn't feeling well, Harriet said, defending her sister at last. But for all that, she has a suitor, and he's going to call on her today. He's not. Which suitor? Father asked. Ante Levan. Father's smiling, indulgent gaze flipped from Harriet to land on Beatrice. Smile melted into open astonishment. You spoke to Ante Levan? What did you speak of? Fidelity, Beatrice said. Honoring's one family. Uh, the stars? Romantic, Mother said. Intellectual, Harriet said, and wrinkled her nose. Beatrice dropped her gaze to her plate. We only talked, she lied. No one needed to know the rest. Besides, Chaz Lander's girls took kisses too seriously. It hadn't meant anything, not from him. I hope you weren't too free with your knowledge, Mother said. A man expects to guide his wife in all things. Displaying too much cleverness can make a woman seem less appealing. Mother is clever. Mother smiled, picking up her teacup once more. Your father is correct, my dear. We understand the shrewdness of women, father said. Your education is unusual compared to a woman of higher birth. I stand by my decision to teach you the keeping of accounts and records, even though your husband is likely to have a secretary. 
It's more than you need to manage a house, but you'll know it if your suppliers are cheating you. That is where a wife's cleverness shines. She could do rather more than that. She hated the idea of pretending to be less than what she was for the sake of her husband's comfort and the hundred little ways she was expected to bend and give way. Now that they had listened to her opinion, he had thanked her for it. He was the kindest man she'd ever met. But was it enough? He's coming here, Harriet exclaimed. Today, he's not, Beatrice said, but father set down his paper and his cup. What are you doing, dawdling down here? You must get ready. But he's not coming here today, father laughed. It's noble that you're not getting your hopes up, but you need to get ready for his calls. Upstairs with you. Be sure that Clara covers every detail. But I know he isn't. Go. Dismissed, Beatrice rose from the table. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, I am also a huge fan of, uh, of your books as well. Um, and uh, if there isn't any questions from the audience, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to try not to just, you know, try and get you and Fonda to talk about the things I think your books have in common. <laughs> um, so let's see if we have any uh, questions from the audience. I don't uh, see any right now. Um, um, so, um, okay. So let's just start with my question that I have for both of you, and then and then we'll 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 find things to ask Yanina and Antonio and Michael as well. Um, which is that um, the Greenbone Saga is a trilogy, and the Kingston Cycle is a trilogy. And did you set out to write trilogies? Was that always the idea? Um, and, uh, and if so, is that intimidating or is that like just what you thought you could do? Or did you think maybe it would be a longer series and then, and then it turned out to be a trilogy? Like, what is the process of being like, I'm writing a trilogy. This is a trilogy. This is three books. I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, so when I wrote Jade City, it was on spec. So I, I wasn't, uh, it wasn't guaranteed to sell. Um, so when I wrote it knowing that it could be a larger story, but I had to write it so that it was also, it, it stood alone and was satisfying as a single volume. Um, but I had a, I, I certainly knew the world could, could contain um, a large, and that was my hope was that it would, would be, a series. So then it went on submission. It sold, um, actually, uh, Chelsea and I have the same editor. So um, it sold to Sarah Guan, who was at Orbit at the time. And um, when it uh, sold, they asked me for a three for, for three books. So at that point, I knew that it was, and I think I had had like, I just, a short period of time to like send them a brief synopsis of what the second and third book would be, um, which you know, of course, changed quite a bit in, in the process of actually um, writing the second and third books. But um, yes, when you when you know that it is going to be a trilogy, um, you can think very big picture about the overall story, um, but also have to bear in mind that each book has to be its own satisfying um, narrative. So um, I I personally. Uh, find it to be a pet peeve when the second book feels like it's just a bridge between the first and second books or it ends on a cliffhanger and it's not its own thing so after I wrote Jade City um, I really I became obsessed with like making sure that second book um, I, I think it's the make it or break it book that second book um, it either, either kind of elevates it or it ends up kind of like the soggy middle so um, yes I I had in my mind the scaffold of how the story would build across the three books with the first be book being a um, conflict between the two clans and then the second book being um, that conflict but taken to an international scope and the third book takes it to an intergenerational scope so that was the way that I structured the trilogy so that it felt um, it, it told an overall arc but then each individual book also had its own arc. Um, for me, for the Kingston cycle, um, 
I wrote the first book um, and it was just me and my computer. There wasn't anybody else involved. Um, and I queried for an agent with Witchmark. And um, when I was writing it, um, the advice was not to write a book that absolutely depended on being a series for your first book. So I didn't. I was like, I'm going to take this advice. I'm going to be a good writer. I'm going to write a story that is just a story. And, and that's it. And I sent it around. And when, um, and when the editor who wanted to buy it said, I love this story. Is there a sequel? I was completely unprepared. I didn't know what to do. Um, so in my mind, I'm freaking out while my mouth is saying, well, you know, I have a couple of ideas and a direction I could take the book. Totally lying. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. Um, and so I had to do I had to do some scrambling around and some real thinking to figure out where I went from the original book. And what I decided was that um, part of the reason why I thought that Witchmark was a standalone was because the main character, Miles Singer's story completed. Like he, he did what his character arc needed him to do. He did it. Um, and so I couldn't actually see writing another book with him as a protagonist. Um, so I changed my... I changed my scope. I went looking around. I decided that what I wanted to do was I wanted to write about a character who also kind of needed to have a novel's worth of experience to like teach them to stop being a nitwit. Um, and so I picked Miles's sister, Grace, who was a minor antagonist in Miles's book, who did a heel face turn. Um, as soon as she realized that what she was doing was wrong. Um, and that second book was extremely difficult. Um, the thing about the first book that you're writing is that nobody is watching you while you're doing it. So you can just, you know, you can do whatever you want. Um, you don't have anyone to disappoint. So just go ahead and do it. But when I was writing the second book, I really, really was anxious about letting people down with my second book. Um, it was a big deal. And in the end, I just had to like hold my nose and jump into the pool um, because if they left it up to me, I would still be revising Storm Song today. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And we do have lots of questions coming in from the audience right now. Um, so uh, for everyone, what was the best advice or worst advice you've ever received on your writing journey so far? Uh, so best advice or worst advice? Worst advice might be, might be funny. Um, Yonina, do you have one? Oh, I do. <laughs> I have a, a few. Worst advice. Well, I don't want to criticize anyone's uh, critiquing of my writing or editing, but um, as an indigenous, prairie indigenous, my vernacular upsets people sometimes. So <laughs> that was a very interesting thing. And I remember when my first book was being edited, phoning my writing mentor, Betsy Warland, and saying, oh my God, I don't know what to do. Like, this seems like they're correcting all my grammar and I, I don't see how that's poetic anymore. And I was just really, really confused. And she, she just knew right away. She said, send me the comments and the stuff, send me 10 pages or so. She goes, they're trying to correct your prairie indigenous vernacular and no, <laughs> it's a big no. <laughs> and I thought that was great. So it's one of the reasons I'm on the Indigenous Editors Association board because we need more Indigenous editors. Um, and we, because we, we are speaking about things too that may be unfamiliar um, and that can happen anytime, but uh, there's the, the passive voice, you know, is apparently scary, uh, but it is also perhaps the way we speak. So what can I say? And I know we don't speak the way we write, but sometimes we do.
Antonio, do you have any? Hey, um, <laughs> I was trying to think. Um, I I think the best advice is um, is to I don't know. There's a lot. It's hard to rank all of the advice, but. Um, I love uh, Walter Mosley about finishing, about stopping writing. He goes, I write, I write a book and I see a problem, I fix it. I see another problem, I fix it. See another problem, I fix it. And one day I see a problem, I have no idea how to fix it. And that's when I know the book's done. <laughs> So I, I always like that as uh, advice that wasn't specifically given to me, but um, it was my favorite advice on it. Um, uh, the worst advice I got was that um, was not to, was a lot of people, you know, I'm writing a memoir and it's like, and first of all, people, there's a bunch of bad advice around that because um for a lot of reasons um but a lot of people it's like well gosh that's a whole universe of advice I think the biggest thing was that people were like you know someone was like don't trust don't let your your editors and your and your publishers change your story and like there was this inherent advice to sort of distrust the editor the editorial folks which was just dumb because um, because um, they're they're generally there to help you get to what you're trying to do and give you outside perspective and and help guide you in places. Not necessarily like so. Mostly that was from people who weren't writers, but they were like, "Well, I want to write a book, but I just don't want to trust anyone with my story." And and I just feel like that's not very practical when you really get down to actually writing a book. It doesn't matter if you're, it's your story or not. You get to points where you can't see the forest from the trees, and in moments like that, I was really happy I had Diane Turbide to um, to call and ask for advice. It was very useful. So that's the worst advice. The best advice, I think, in regards to memoirs, Kinesia Lubrin, who talked to me about, um, you know, my sister and Kinesia I met through I was doing just music and I was throwing music events, but I, but poetry nights at music events. And I just saw her online and I thought, oh, she's from St. Lucia. Yo, my sister. Okay, come through. And she was amazing. And she told me, she's like, look, you know, it, just the advice around, um, around just in, in especially in a time we ha we're going through like black misery and talking about a story look anyone that writes their life honestly will have some hurt and pain and trauma in it and some family drama in it you know it's it, you're either lying or are not very self-aware if there isn't any um but, but i feel like when as a black man writing that i think we always get the story always becomes, here's a whole bunch of misery and black misery. And Kinesia told me, taught me, which I was very thankful for, how to gracefully accept the commentary, but shift the narrative towards, you know, my story is about creativity and resilience and, 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 and it, the explosion of life that I responded, that came out of me because of the circumstances I was in. And that's what I see when I see it but that doesn't get celebrated. And, and I think the, old, the other thing, which is really important that she was talking about is like, you know, people of color, we're, we're writers, we're experts in craft, but we're speak, you know, but we are frequently being asked to speak for all black people everywhere and, and frequently being asked to be experts in, in you know, racial justice and, and all of these things. And I'm like, look, I have a particular experience that's mine. And I think a lot of what we're struggling for is just the, the freedom to just be defined by, by what we do and how we do it, you know, like as opposed to, oh, you had bad things happen to you. So let's plug you into this story that's ready made. And that was Kinesia's 
group of it we had a whole like heart to heart before the the publicity campaign started and she gave me a lot of beautiful advice about how to navigate that so yeah that's a long answer but there you go <laughs> Chelsea best advice worst advice um the thing about writing advice is when I think about the worst advice I ever got it's actually really good advice for somebody else. It's just terrible for me. And that is, don't edit as you go. If you know that you've made a mistake in your previous story, make a note of it and continue on as if you'd fixed it. Mm -mm, I can't do it. Um, <laughs> if I know that something is wrong back there, I have to go back and fetch it. Like, I can't leave it. I cannot. Um, and so that leads me to the best advice that I have ever gotten. Don't let anybody tell you what your process should be if you have already proven to yourself that your way of doing it works. That's fantastic. <laughs> Fonda? Uh, yeah, I think like the, on the worst advice front, um, it's hard to like, I, I think Chelsea hit it on, on the head when she said like good advice for some people, maybe bad advice for you and vice versa, because everyone is kind of just telling you like what works for them. Um, when, when they give advice, um, I would say in one of the things that I heard quite a bit when I was breaking into speculative fiction was to start off with short stories. Um, and that you had to like write short stories before you could write novels, which was, is absolutely not the case. I just, I jumped straight into writing novels and I actually, um, had to come, I came back to learn how to write short stories because they're very different. Um, there are, they're different art forms they are almost like a different sort of medium, if you will. Um, and then on the, on the really good advice side, um, I once heard it said that, um, to succeed in this, this, this creative field you need um two of three things or your career is like a, a three-legged stool and and the legs are made of um hard work talent and luck and you can be uh you can be hard working and um and talented or you can be talented and lucky or you can be hard working and and lucky but like you've got to in order you can control two of those things but you like can't you can't do anything about the luck but um, if you uh, if you put all you can into the th things that you can control, um, it's kind of like making yourself open to luck. And there is so much in this business that is kind of fortuitous, um, like the right editor at the right time, or your you know your your book hitting at a time that like people are looking for that particular thing, or or not, or your book launching during a pandemic. Like anything could happen, um, and you have to sort of learn to to weather those those storms and and to be able to to accept both the good luck that comes your way and and also persevere through some just really unpredictable things in publishing that's also really great advice and some good advice that's turned out to be useful right because even your nina's bad advice ended up with her becoming an editor which is a good outcome so I love all of that. We do have another question from our audience, which is, um, you're also awesome. So there's a compliment as writers and readers. Uh, when and why did you decide you wanted to write? Who will take it up first? Yonina, how about you? Because your, your bio starts with how you're like an older uh, uh, starter, right? Absolutely. Well, it's, it, I don't want to be, tell you the long story, so I'll try to make it short. Um, when I was about 31, uh, so 35 years ago, uh, I had my astrology, astrology chart read by my dearest friend, who was an amazing astrologer. And she said, you're going to be a writer later in life, and you're going to be successful. And I was thinking, in what world, like how, like, I'm, I'm, you know, grinding it out here as a bank employee, airline employee, like this, I just don't even see how that could be possible. And I've kind of forgot about it. And then at 50, I had to quit work because I had uh, chronic health issues. And I was, uh, I'm not one to sit around. So 
when the pamphlet arrived for the writer's studio at SFU, I thought, heck, I'm just going to apply. It'd be kind of fun. And I had to write 20 pages because I had already shredded all my journals. Any writing I'd ever done was just in my journals. And I shredded them as a purge, a cleansing, a clearing. And they accepted me. But it was a lot of that little voice because when I picked up the pamphlet, that little voice, when I said, I think I want to apply, my second thought was, no way. And then the little voice said, you're going to be accepted. Do it. So I did it. I was rejected. And then two days later, they called me and said, we've changed our mind. (laughs) So what can I say? The little voice is great guidance. It's really helpful with writing when you're stuck on something. Um, (laughs) I really appreciate it. Um, So, yeah. And I didn't want to be a poet. I was going to write my memoir, which I just finished. (laughs) So I wrote two books of poetry. And now they're still calling it poetry, but it's prose and poetry. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. Chelsea, when did you decide you wanted to write? Oh, um, when did I decide I wanted to write? Um, I don't really know. I don't know. Um, I remember when I was a kid in elementary school, um, we got an assignment, um, to write a story and I think it was connected to something that we had read or something but we were supposed to write a story and I wrote a story about me and my friends um at the PNE which is like an a yearly thing where this amusement park in Vancouver used to open up for a couple of weeks and there would be like rides and and stuff like that um, and we went to the PNE, um, and there were no adults. I don't know how that happened, but there were none. Um, and uh, we were in a fun house, and my friends thought it would be a funny joke to um, run off and leave me to go through the fun house by myself. <gasps> um, and so I went into the hall of mirrors and there was something in the mirror, but was there something in the mirror or was it me? I don't know. And it was just like this whole psychological kind of thing. You know, is it, is it like a supernatural monster? Or like, is she just imagining things until finally um, I realized that I was trapped and that I would have to defeat the monster. And so I started breaking mirrors and I, um, fought the monster and if this is sounding a heck of a lot like the last scene of enter the dragon there is a reason for that um and my teacher thought that it was really good um she didn't talk about the underlying psychological issues or anything like that she just said that I was good at writing um and I took that away and I would do it for fun um I didn't really like take it as a serious thing that I could actually do um until much later in life um but I don't know exactly if I ever decided that I was going to be a writer I just wrote things because it was fun Um, And sometimes I sent them out into the world just to see what would happen to them if I did. That's, uh, that's wonderful, but it's also like a really funny story that I'm happy that I heard. (laughs) Antonio, when and why did you know you wanted to write? First of all, I love Chelsea's uh, mouthpiece pop down. Bam. (laughs) <laughs> engage um yeah I don't know like I think um growing up as a child um mostly it was like not having my parents around and living in Trinidad which is a very like we just tell stories to everyone everything's oral like I don't remember um watching a lot of tv as a child I don't remember um 
like we were poor. We were like, it's the third world. So we didn't really have much of anything in way of uh, entertainment. So we would entertain each other. We would tell ghost stories. We would tell what the uh, Nancy stories we would tell. Um, we would just tell stories about what happened. Like you, you, you won't believe what just happened down the road and everyone would just gather to hear the stories. And so I grew up sort of watching that and, and not having my parents around made me made me really want the attention where I was like oh wow you can get attention if you tell stories and so I was you know and I was I was fascinated by it and then you know my grandma was was old at the time and would always read the bible and her king james bible and her eyes were bad so she kind of taught me how to read when I was really young so that I could be her eyes and so the combination of watching how the power of telling stories and how it got all that attention and then just reading all of those crazy Old Testament stories, which are like, <laughs> you know, whether you believe or not, they're, they're, they're very entertaining at times. Um, and and I, my mind was just blown. And so for me, I was just always, that's who I always was. And I would, I would write stories as young as I think I wrote my first short stories when I was like nine or 10 or something. And yeah, I never really questioned uh, about being a writer and I took English literature and it was just, it, I never really ever questioned about being a writer. Cause I was like, that's just that thing that, that I like doing and that I always do. And for me, the oral tradition of telling stories was, was one and the same with writing them down. So I was walking around telling stories. And to me, that was, I was writing, right? I was creating. And, uh, and so to me, it, there wasn't a moment where I said, hey, I'm a writer. It was more like, I just was always me. And that always involved telling stories. Okay, and our, finally, Fonda. I wanted to be a writer when I was quite young, probably like eight or 10 years old, and um, wrote my first novel on the school bus. I had a, a long bus ride. Uh, it was like 45 minutes each way. So I just started writing in this, like, in this, on this pad of loose paper and um, ended up writing like 350 pages of like this dragon on a magical quest story. And um, then in high school, I like wrote another novel with a friend of mine and we, I wrote it in biology class. I just <laughs> cast everyone in my um, high school class in like different characters in this like pulp comic book no noir novel um, and then like printed it out and gave it to people for graduation. So um, I wanted to be a writer, but didn't think that it was like a real job. <laughs> and I think I remember at one point my parents were like, yeah, that's nice. Um, but like, you know, think about like jobs that will be like have a stable income. And so anyway, so I went to college and had a whole like 10 year plus career um, in business, graduated with a degree in finance, was management consultant, worked as, as a corporate strategist in Fortune 500 companies. Um, and at some point realized I just fallen off the writing bandwagon because I'd gotten super busy. I had a full-time day job. I had two small kids. I had no time for anything <laughs> other than other than that. Um, and then I realized that I just really missed it. I used to do that. I remember I had this whole like career visioning um, process because I was moving between one uh, position at my company um, and they were asking me, well, what, what's like where do you see yourself in five years? When you see like, you know, do you want to be VP of this or VP of that? And I was like, I don't really want to be any of those things. <laughs> like, so they, I, did, I did this whole, I, like, I got this whole, you know, career guidebook kind of exercise thing going. And, and some of the guiding questions were things like, well, what do you remember enjoying doing when you were a child? And like, where do you feel most fulfilled? And all these things. And, and uh, that's when I remembered like, gosh, I used to really love writing. I don't do that anymore. Anymore. So um, I, I just decided to take that passion seriously. And I kind of realized, you know, well, I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> so I've got to, if I still want to pursue this pipe dream of, of being published, I've got to start. So I made some changes and basically was like, eh, 
let's we'll just like take this easier day job and like go part time and and try to find um, you know ways to to carve out time in my life to to write and I start taking writing classes and then um, and, and then sending manuscripts out on query and then I got an agent and the book so one thing led to another and haven't looked back I thought I would like miss my corporate I mean I miss the income of the corporate day job but everything else no everything <laughs> everything else is like I've, I've no regrets about making that career transition. Uh, thank you all for sharing with us and thank you the, in the audience for giving us your questions. It's been such an amazing evening. Um, please come back for our next event, uh, November 10th, 2021. Uh, we start off the new Brockton season. That's, that's our cycle uh, with JL Richardson, Kelly Robson, Mary Lou Dickinson and Lisa Richter. Uh, we will be back here still online on Ephemera's YouTube. Thank you so much to Ephemera. And uh, thank you to Brockton writers, readers, listeners, and supporters. We will see you then. Uh, and uh, next week on Wednesday, remember, there is an Ephemera. And uh, I may see you then as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.